Hi, I'm Dr. Gwen, and my channel is all about creating content that empowers the neurodiverse community. In this episode, Melody Valenzuela and Jessica Lee come onto the show to update us on what NeuroTalent Works is up to today and how they are solving the unemployment problem for neurodivergent adults. <music> Welcome to the show, everyone. I have two lovely, lovely, beautiful ladies, Melody Valenzuela and Jessica Lee with me from NeuroTalent Works. Hello. How are you guys? Hi. Oh, so um, happy to be with you. Yeah. And, Thanks. you know, you guys have been on the show before. So, you know, you know the drill. Um, but, you know, it would be great. And the reason why we're doing this, one is to really get an update on NeuroTalent Works. Jess, when you came on the show, you were not NeuroTalent Works then. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Right? You yeah. kind of rebranded um, for lots of different reasons, but you used to be Spectrum Work. Wait. Yeah. What? Right? You got it. Yeah. The Spectrum, the Spectrum Works. works. Yeah. Right? And now you're NeuroTalent Works. Yeah. So I just want to let the audience know that. So just let us know, like, so tell us a little bit about NeuroTalent Works and like what you guys are up to today, because you guys have been doing a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, Gwen, thank you so much for having us here. Um, it's always such a pleasure to be with you. And you've been such an important person in our journey from the early days of our previous the Spectrum Works. We are the same organization with the same mission, um, but expanded towards neurodiversity inclusion. So we are here partnering with businesses to advance neurodiversity inclusion and employment. Um, so what does it mean to really embrace a diversity of minds in the workplace? Um, gosh, Gwen, from our last interview till now, I'm really proud to share um, the programs that we have. We have our core programs of what we've been doing for the last five years and a new program that I'm really excited to share with you and listeners about that we're launching in a few months. So to start with our core programs, um, when we think about employment, you know, the reason we started our organization was to address this high 80% unemployment rate that we saw primarily in the autism community, but now even just at large with those that are neurodivergent or neurodistinct is the term that our team is starting to use. Um, and we tackle this in two ways. Uh, one is on the business side, where we saw there are a lot of nonprofits and organizations that are doing wonderful work to get job candidates um, ready, trained for the workplace, who's getting the business ready? That was the big question that we were answering. Um, five years later, I can tell you, it's a really very exciting time where you see where diversity, equity, and inclusion is really um, being championed within companies. And we work with companies to educate them on what neurodiversity is and that it is a missing piece in most DEI efforts. The disability community in general is not given the same attention as other diversity dimensions. Um, and then beyond that, neurodiversity. And yet we know that many of the strategies that work for being inclusive to the neurodivergent communities specifically is good for everybody. And we'll talk about that later with universal design and how neurodiversity increases equity for everybody. Um, a lot more to say on that. But we have two, uh, I guess, three core programs where um, all of these things come together. What I'm really excited to share, especially for your listeners, on our talent readiness side. So we use the term talent because in companies, talent acquisition is a team. It's all about getting the right employees into the right jobs, making that perfect match as much as, as well as we can. Um, we intake job candidates one-on-one. -on -one. So when you go to our website, neurotalentworks.org, um, there is a talent intake form 
where if you are a job candidate that is looking for business professional employment in mostly like office settings or even remote work, um, you submit your resume to us. And upon submission of that resume, you get an email to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with our team member, our talent readiness team. You get an hour with our talent readiness team where we just want to get to know you. Where are you in your career journey? What are resources we can point you to? Um, and we give feedback on your resume because that's the first thing a recruiter is going to look at um, or any employer will look at. And it makes all the difference to have a resume that is going to catch the attention of someone to want to bring you into an interview. So we do resume feedback um, one on one. Then you're invited to trainings that we are offering on resume and interview skills. We're doing one now on self-advocacy and disclosure. How do you decide if you're going to disclose your disability in the interview process or in your job? And this is both for job candidates and for employees that are already in jobs. Um, it's for anybody, really. And we're also excited that we're offering office hour appointments. So we provide mock interviews, um, we, which is a really key component and just basic feedback that we can to support any neurodistinct individual who's looking for employment. Um, I'm also really excited to share that our team has also launched a peer networking group. Uh, we just launched this month, once a month um, for neurodistinct individuals. You can drop into this networking event to meet others who are in a similar stage, um, whether it's looking for a job or just starting or being in a job. There's a community that's here for you um, to support you and to walk in that journey with you. So. That's the talent side. I want to talk for a while here, Gwen. So you pause me. <laughs> go ahead, Jess. Okay. Yeah, go I'm ahead. gonna finish on the the business side because that is all about building and supporting our community and a talent pool um, that we are preparing, hoping to be preparing for jobs um, with our business partners. So on the business side, uh, a lot of our team comes from the corporate world. And um, there's a lot of effort that it takes to bring inclus inclusion efforts into a company. Um, we are here to be a partner, an advisor, to walk with businesses through that, to educate on what neurodiversity is, what are the barriers that our community face um, in the interview process, in employment in general? How do you better understand disability a disclosure and accommodations? Um, and more importantly, workplace strategies that are going to help the neurodiverse community be successful in their jobs, but also equally for managers um, to understand how to be supportive managers to their employees. And this is not just their neurodiverse employees, it's all of their employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so we work with businesses, we provide consulting, customized consulting to meet a business exactly where they are, even if they're just exploring this for the first time, or they're ready to launch a public neurodiversity at work program. We can scale across all dimensions, small, medium, and large businesses. We provide training on neurodiversity. We have three courses we offer to businesses. And we also do staffing, so hiring initiatives with your talent acquisition team to get diverse, neurodiverse talent into your pipeline. And then lastly, support and coaching, um, which is how Melody and I came together, which I know we'll dig into, and what it looks like to be um, for professional development to happen. And again, this is not just for our neurodiverse community that's hired with our business partners, it's also the managers. How do you develop as an inclusive leader? So mm -hmm. just, just yeah. small things. Since just small, just little it, things. <laughs> yeah, just just little things. It's so exciting to hear because you know what you're talking about is creating systemic changes. Yeah. Um. And so you're really working top down, bottom up, right? You're you, the business, the business aspect of this, and I, I, I observe the same thing. You know, in these DEI initiatives, or I like to call them Jedi initiatives, because usually it includes <laughs> justice. So I just rearrange, you yes. know, just to fit. But, um. Brilliant. What I typically see is that the diversity dimension is race, gender, yes. 
right? It, and it's yes. typically not um, neurological diversity. Right. And yeah. this is something that I think is so, I, I'm so glad that you're doing something about this. So, you know, you've got like, so you're, you're, you're creating, edu you're, you're, you're educating, you're providing support and tools for businesses. You're also saying, Hey, like there are reasons why you want your workforce or your talent mm -hmm. to be diverse. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's that piece. And then obviously like, and I'm, you know, I'm very married or attached to the talent piece because I am usually in the position of supporting, um, neurodivergent yeah. adults. And so that's really exciting to me that, you know, you're, you're really working. So top down, bottom up, you know, in, in this and really solving those problems, which is so fantastic. Um, you know, you brought up universal design, Jess, and, you know, universal design is something that comes up in education actually quite a bit. You know, um, what is universal design and why is that helpful in the workplace or necessary in the workplace? Yeah. How about I'll start that and then Melody, please chime in because yeah. you are way more the expert in this. Um, the way when we look at universal design, exactly what you said, this is not new to the education space. Um, in fact, it's such an important part of how education and learning is developed. Um, and we realize that, you know, my favorite image metaphor I like to bring to our business partners is let's say you had $5,000 and you had to build an entrance into your building. Are you going to spend 5,000 to build stairs or are you going to spend 5,000 to build a ramp? The answer should be the ramp <laughs> um, <laughs> because the ramp is going to allow more people to walk into this building or to come into this building rather. Um, mm -hmm. And this is to me such a beautiful illustration of universal design where we are intentionally considering um, our our whole, like where, how can we build processes, procedures, systems that are going to reach the most people, that are gonna make it accessible to the most people. Um, in the workplace, something that sounds really simple in this regard is even sending an agenda ahead of time to a meeting, basic. Everyone's like, of course, of course you do that. But the discipline of sending an agenda ahead of time makes all the difference for anybody who is neurodistinct and anybody who may have anxiety coming into social gatherings or into like a meeting with more than one person. Um, the discipline of doing those things is going to create more psychological safety for everyone coming to this meeting, but it will especially be helpful for someone who might be neurodistinct um, and who might show up to that meeting and be able to contribute in a more meaningful way because they know what to expect, um, that they're not thinking on their feet um, and having to navigate an ambiguity. Their structure, this is why we're meeting, this is what we're discussing, here's our goal for this meeting. Again, it sounds like something that everyone does, normal business practice, but the discipline of it makes all the difference. And there's so many other practices that we know, but one example of universal design, Melody probably has more that she can add to this. Um, but to us, it's so important to think about the fact also that neurodiversity, the complexity of this diversity dimension is that it's not apparent. You probably already have employees in your company who are neurodistinct, who have not disclosed, people who are um, maybe having mental health challenges, and those come in seasons for us in our lives, right? And so these are the practices mm -hmm. that will make all the difference to an entire workforce. So mm -hmm. I could go on and on, but I'm going to pause there. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Mel, do you want to weigh in on universal design? I mean, there's a reason, you know, universal yeah. design is really big in the inclusion space, uh, educationally. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a heart. I, I feel it's such a, it's a framework 
for how we think about mm-hmm. educational inclusion. But um, Mel, in regards to universal design, specifically mm-hmm. as it relates to the workplace, really quick, pause that really quick. Jessica, what are the current statistics right now on underemployment or unemployment in the neuro di- in the di- neurodiversity community? Do you know those off the top of your head? They, I unfortunately, they, I don't think they've changed much in five years. Um, mm. It might be the same as when we spoke last. Eighty okay. percent unemployment rate, fifty percent under employment rate, and I'm so glad you called that out because we have so many job candidates in our pool that have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees that are not working or they're working in jobs that are not utilizing their skills and their education that they studied and got a degree in. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's you guys for the audience. That's what underemployed means. It means that I have training and experience um, for a job that's higher level than what I'm doing now. I will say my bias as a psychologist is that if we were to think about this psychologically and emotionally, Hmm. that is that situation. I've gone to school. I've gotten training. I have a degree and I'm working at an entry in an entry level position that didn't require any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Leaves someone feeling underwhelmed. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and more. Anyway, yeah. okay, thanks mm-hmm. for doing that, Jess. I just wanted to like clarify the need, you know, there's a need here obviously, and employment is a huge part of adult living. Um mm-hmm. it is the thing that allows us freedom and autonomy and um self-reliance and joy and access to our passions. I mean, like this is critical, critical, critical. Okay. Let's go mm-hmm. back. So, maybe this is a good place to talk about how Melody got involved in NeuroTalent Works. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe do that. Beca- and then, Mel, if we want to touch on universal design within that, that would be great. But, Jess, how did Melody come to NeuroTalent Works as talent? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, tremendous talent. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> well. Like, why did you see the knee? Like, Yes. What? Because there's a need that's being filled now that um, yeah, that wasn't being filled before. Yeah. So we here's the thing. When we started as a startup, we said, "Hey, businesses, we're here to support you to introduce you to this untapped talent pool," and we were um, starting to help facilitate in place um, neurodistinct individuals into employment with our business partners. And we said, hey, business partner, like we're here, we're here to help you. Um, And we made, I would say, a vast assumption that um, for anybody who was ready, who interviewed, who got a job, that um, they would be successful in their role um, and that we would just be here for support along the way as needed tap you know come tap on our door whenever we can be helpful we care about sustainment we care about not just someone starting a job but that they're successful in their job long term we didn't know quite what that meant or what that would need to look like um what we discovered is well first let's talk about the fact that the pandemic hit right in the middle of all of this and we started seeing this sudden shift into remote jobs. When you start a job remotely, especially, there is so much that we um, forget to talk about um, because gosh, Zoom fatigue is very real. And um, I find myself, even with our employees that we're starting full-time virtually on our team, that there's a lot of those Um, unwritten rules about communication. How do we communicate with each other? What is the culture of the team? Um, A lot of those things that you forget or take for granted um, with someone who's starting in a new role to explain to them. And for our community, especially having clear definitions about this is how we communicate as a team. 
Um, these are expectations for your performance. Um, this is what your job role requires. Spelling those things out really clearly, having them written down and like an agreed upon manner um, is really important for any of us starting a job. But it's, again, especially for our community. And we started having issues come up um, from both managers and from our narrow distinct team, or, you know, colleagues that we placed into jobs, um, and we were addressing them reactively. So we were intervening when things were, you know, feel, people were feeling stuck, there were challenges that came up. And after that happened a few times, it became very clear that there was a lot we could do proactively to not um, get to a place where it became so heightened at that point too, right? Like I kept thinking, oh my gosh, how much better would this have been if I had known about this three months ago, five months ago? Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I said, oh my gosh, we need help. Where, what does this look like? I looked at traditional disability services and I knew about job coaching. Job coaching is not at the level that we need it to be for the types of jobs and companies that we are placing our community into. Um, and which I'm actually very proud of and excited about because this means we get to raise the bar for everybody um, and for this community at large of what their outcomes could look like as an adult. But yeah, I mean, we hit really troubling times and I needed somebody who could come in to answer questions that I couldn't answer to managers because I don't have a neuropsychology background. I'm not a neuroscientist. I don't understand exactly how the mind works um, for our, and especially for our community, I needed a specialist. And, um, and so that's where I have to thank you, Gwen, because you have been such a critical advisor for us from the beginning. And to know that I could come to you and say, Gwen, I'm hitting this issue, where do I go? Who, please help. And you're like, <laughs> I got you. I have the perfect person for you to meet. And that's how we met Melody. So I thank you for this. Um, it's so special to meet strangers, complete strangers, who now become business partners and friends, um, which mm -hmm. both of you have become. So <laughs> thank you. And that's Thanks, how Melody Jess. entered. Yeah, that's how and enter Melody and, and enter left yeah. left stage, Mel. Um, hey, yeah. Mel, talk Here to talk to us about talk to us about some of the really practical problems that you're solving, and I'm sure you're doing it through grace and expertise and skill. Um, but I imagine knowing you, you're bringing skill, practical skill based types of solutions empowering yeah. people with skills. Talk to us about that. Like, as you come onto the yeah. scene, what did you find? What, what what were the things that you were kind of solving pretty quickly? Yeah, I do love to make it practical because um, I just, it's, it's all well and good to talk very conceptually about um, how the brain works or um, how relationships work or um, executive functioning skills, great. We understand what those are, whether you're looking at the list of 10 or 11 or 12 or 13, because everyone divides them up differently. Um, but so what? Like, we have to get to work. Like, I'm having a conversation with my boss, and it is not going well, and I can't figure out why. So I can read an article on executive functioning and have no idea um, how to bring that down to earth and how to get granular about it and actually leave with a to-do list or some strategies that are that I can try and experiment with actually help my relationship with my manager. So, um, and I think that's what we run into, well, a couple things, um, you know, specifically the, the first couple of individuals that I was involved with um, were autistic, are autistic, and, um, you know, I think a lot of the executive functioning issue or a lot of the issues they were having were based on executive functioning um lack of skill there and um 
they were already in a place of just frustration. I mean, um, when you think about psychological safety and the need to both that that under um, under employment, what that would do to someone psychologically, they they start to believe about themselves um, what they're that they are incapable of something more, and that's depressing, mostly because it's not true. <laughs> um, and so then, you know, when they're having zoom back to the folks that I started talking to when they're having conflict with their manager and not able to figure out where that is coming from, that will do the same thing. They'll have anxiety, they'll have depression, and the voices start going in their heads about what they're incapable of, um, which leads to more depression and the cycle spirals downward um, instead of upward. And so, so what's when they can start to understand kind of some of the nitty gritty about what's going wrong, let's say in just the communication with their boss. We had an instance um, where we were, I was, I was practicing with, let, let's call him Adam. I'm practicing with Adam. We're trying to build some skills and we're, we're going to try to um, figure out how to email effectively. And, um, with this particular boss. So it's, let's think about the way this manager thinks and receives information and processes information and expresses information. So we have those kind of three aspects of the information processing. And how does this talent member do that? Um, take in information, process it and put it back out. So when there's a mismatch in the style of processing and uh, that, that will, mess with the communication, especially in something um, that's written down, let's say an email, because if you're not, if that is not your preferred learning style or your preferred information input, then that is going to be overwhelming. Um, let's say you're reading an email and you have a visual processing or, or just even visual stress, looking at high contrast and, and your email is black and white, that's gonna cause visual stress. That's going to cause you to look away from the screen. That's gonna cause you to break down your, that's gonna break down your ability to sustain attention. That's gonna break down your ability to process the information. That's gonna affect your working memory in terms of being able to hold everything at once. So there's a lot that can affect our brains um, when we when we consider a mode of communication. So the the example with Adam, I was going to say we were practicing, you know, let's just make sure that you respond to your boss and you say, yes, I got it. This is what you asked of me. These are the three things you asked of me. I'm going to do one, two, and three. Is that correct? So there's just that immediate mirrored back. The boss writes back and he goes, all good. And Adam is like, what? does all good even mean? Like, what, what does that mean? It was not direct enough um, feedback for him to be able to, you know, he, that expression is, it's, it's, you know, colloquial to us. Many of us just use it in and out like it's no big deal. And it is a big deal if you are a concrete thinker. So that kind of communication was being missed and instead, now because of Adam is used to having some conflict with his manager, instead of writing back the way he might if he was not stressed out, instead of being able to say, hey, so I just want to make sure that means yes, I do go through with these three steps. He's not able to say that because he's ar he is already burdened by that relationship. And um, so then that just creates more confusion. So, so in that sense, one of the things that, um, you know, when we're, when we encounter that kind of conflict, this is when we really want to explore executive functioning and especially, um, information processing, which isn't necessarily a EF skill, but, um, yeah, so we want to, we, we start actually with neuro talent when we get to that coaching stage, we've developed this six month model that we're very happy with that includes talking to um, 
it, it includes this, in the first few sessions, what we're doing is going through those executive functioning strengths and weaknesses with our manager together as a team. Mm -hmm. We did this actually with the neuro talent team, which was so fun yeah. because Jessica and I ended up finding that um, we have opposite strengths and weaknesses. Two of our executive functioning, two of my executive functioning strengths were Jessica's weaknesses and two of Jessica's strengths were my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So how fun now for us to be able to work um, together and have Jessica be like, Melody, time management, it's not my thing. You keep us on track. And I'm like, oh, it is so my thing. I, we need two <laughs> more, you got two minutes or we're moving on, you know? And so when you do that within um, a professional relationship between a new hire and a manager, you are just setting up for success. I know how you think, I, I acknowledge how you think, I honor how you think, I want to work with how you think, I accept how you think, and it's gotta go both ways because if you have a manager sitting there like, yeah, I mean, I'm a CEO or something else high up, then you assume that all their executive functionings are in order and they're really good at what they're doing and so they start to expect that of their employees. But we don't have the same brains. We do not have the same brains. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. And so understanding those about each other and being able to front load strategies for how to communicate well, or what does the environment need to look like for my employee to really be you know, on top of his game, we can do those in advance and we avoid conflict because we have avoided stress and we have avoided ex executive functioning pitfalls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really, really cool position to be in. Yeah, I love it. You know, I, I mean, I think what's so cool is that there's this kind of idea, you know, that uh, what it sounds like you guys are doing is like there's kind of this like discovery phase, right, which brings up awareness in these specific ways, uh, specific traits, specific skills that we see are necessary in the workplace. And it's you're really talking more like your example was more about soft skills than about work execution. Um, yeah. But right. So we've got like this this discovery phase where there's some awareness and then we've got understanding from both parts because it's equally as important for the talent to understand what the strengths and weaknesses are of their manager as well, if that's part mm -hmm. of the discovery. And that understanding then leads to change, right? Mm -hmm. And we see this like over the course of any kind of systems work, which is, you know, awareness, acceptance, change, which mm -hmm. is something that is kind of a necessary thing to go through. But now mm -hmm. there's this framework that offers this kind of going back to the idea of top down, management down, bottom up, mm -hmm. talent up, um, and how those guys come together in this kind of Venn diagram. Here's how, what crosses over in the middle is really our relationship and how we work together. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a culture of understanding, which reduces psychological mm -hmm. stress, which then allows us to use our bandwidth and other things like, I don't know, work. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of the beginning. Mm -hmm. Can I go into the UDL yeah. model? Yeah. And yeah. How yeah. That go, really go. Helps thing. Right. Yeah. Because that's UDL, ML, to... universal design learning. Just, you know, just for the yeah. audience. You, okay. You know, yes. So we talked about, um, I love Jessica's example. Yes. Okay. UDL, universal design for learning. Um, when we start with this relationship between the hiring manager and talent, we start, we want to start with that place of understanding, and then we want to move to, okay, so what do we do about it then? And so Jessica's example of universal design, I think of as like one side of the tortilla mm. <laughs> and, um, where we're trying to, if we have $5,000 to spend, we want to use it so that m as many people can access our, the entrance to our building as possible. So why am I going to build stairs and cut some people out? Why am I going to spend money building both? Like that's just not efficient. I don't want to build, you know, stairs and a ramp, just build one ramp. Now everybody can use it. It's efficient and we have funding for other things. Great. The like business case for UDL. Um, so then the learning side of things, if you, if you think about the other side of tort the tortilla, I don't know why tortillas in my head, 
but but it's like lunchtime. Jessica's yeah, we're getting there. That's Jessica's funny. example is how do we build how do we take one thing that addresses multiple needs? The other side of the tortilla would be um we just have multiple needs, so we're gonna have to do multiple things. Mm. Um, which is the other side of universal design. That is to say, um, the, the way that I, let's see, I say I'm trying to teach my new higher, uh, skill. That's something basic with just using the, the calendar function so that all of the employees are all on the same page on that team. If I'm trying to teach that skill, I want to be aware of how that person learns, how that person thinks. And if I don't know, which a lot of times we don't. We want to use we want to use multiple mean multimodal teaching. We want to think about how to expose them to this skill in as many different ways as possible. So a lot of times, and this is what we do in the classroom, a teacher stands up in front and talks about it, and everybody listens. Cool. If you're not an auditory processor, that's not going to go very well for you. Um, so what we want to do is shift and say, yeah, manager, you can still do it your style. But when you're doing this presentation, let's also make it visual. Let's also let people record it so they can listen to it later. Let's also have something on the table that's touchable and movable so that we can have that the concrete aspect. So what you're doing is saying, if I can touch it and see it and read it and listen to it, we have all the ways for our brain to take in that information. So not only is that going to hit multiple learners in the room, but that's going to get a single brain to engage in lots of different ways. And that's how we're going to learn and, and um, retain the information. So multiple means of engagement, multiple means of exposure, multiple means of expression. We want, let's say we're in the classroom, um, we want to let that student interpret the information and present it back to us in a way that shows us that they've really learned it. But if you don't have a high, if you're not a, a verbally expressive person, giving a speech on your topic is going to be like the worst way for you to show that you know the information. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a tactile person, like let's say you're putting together the syntax in a Spanish sentence, and you could build a model and you can have, you know, here's this ending for this verb and here's this ending for this verb. Why not let kids show what they know through the mode that makes the most sense to them? So then workplace, because that's what we would do in the classroom to modify a classroom. So mm -hmm. much of this applies to the workplace where, you know, kids are adults. We're still brains. We're still human beings. You can still take all of the universal design for learning um, ideas and apply them to the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, so the ramp and the stairs, or you're giving a presentation, let your employees consider the, that information in any way that makes the most sense to them. Um, and when we talk about, well, I don't know if Jessica wants to hit on this, but, but Part of the training um, and what we try to do with, with some of these companies is to say um, how accessible some of these modifications or, you know, accommodations might be um, when mm -hmm. you're making the business case for this. Um, it's important for our businesses to know that it makes sense for them. Um, you know, as a business owner, I don't want to spend a lot of extra money if I don't have to. I want those funds to go towards my goal. I want those funds to go towards my salaries. Um, if I don't have to spend extra money, I don't want to. A business exists to make money. So um, so I think part of the pushback that we get initially is, yeah, great, multiple, multiple modes for all different kinds of brains. That's going to cost me time and money um, is, is what the businesses, you know, would have to say about it. And then what we have to say about it is what Jess? Yeah, I um, what we have to say about it is looking look at the cost of turnover, the what you are already paying to prepare someone for a job just to onboard them, get them going in your system, start learning your job, like not only learning your job, 
um, learning the company, all of that institutional knowledge and the time it takes to get somebody ramped up in that way and then to lose it all of a sudden is a huge waste of money. Um, and so that's why we now require every, every company that hires with us is also committing to six months of proactive coaching and development um, with Melody and a team of other specialists um, to have this be a part of the standard model from the beginning, because we are going to have much greater results when we are proactive about this, when we are intentional about the things that we know can be set up systems that are going to work for both the individual talent and the manager. Um, and what makes me really excited about all of this is the language that we are putting out into the world to talk about these things. I am what you could call a civilian to this community. Um, I have a cousin that has Down syndrome, but no one um, in my life that is autistic this was a whole new community to me stepping into this work. And as I've done this work and the things that I'm learning, like from Melody and other experts, I'm like, we gotta, we gotta use language and words for someone like me who has no educational background, lived experience, some lived experience with this community to understand it in a way that is um, also maintaining the dignity of mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. period. Um, and yes, for some, and you know, it's interesting, again, we could talk for hours, but Gwen, you know, it's an interesting, <laughs> um, question I got from a manager the other day where what's cool to see in the community is this younger generation is really owning who they are, how their minds work. Mm -hmm. And it's the, like an amazing groundswell that is coming up where companies now have to be reactive and better yet proactive. And yeah, I got mm -hmm. a question from a manager the other day and she said, she said, Jessica, I don't know. I don't know how to approach neurodiversity inclusion. I said, she said, I have some employees who come and share with me and say, I am neurodistinct, neurodivergent. This is how my mind works. Like, this is what I need to do yeah. my best work. This is me. Mm -hmm. And she said, then I have other employees who say, hey, I'm disclosing. I am neurodivergent. It is a disability for me. I need these accommodations. I'm not able to do some of these things. I need modifications to my work. And she said, how, how do I approach these two different, um, you know, mindsets, personal opinions from the community? How is, do I, as a manager, as an HR professional react to this? And I said, you know what the best part is, is you don't, you don't need to judge it. You don't need to decide what's right and what's wrong. You get to hold it you get to hold it with this community and say, oh, okay. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. How can I be helpful to you? How does your mind work best? Mm -hmm. And Melody, when we first started in this work, I was like, okay, Melody, I am exhibit A. Jessica, please, and I'm telling myself this, right? I'm like, okay, Jessica, let me explain to you, Melody, how my mind works. And I was like, well, um, right. I, I you. take in information. <laughs> I don't have any yeah. words to use to describe how my mind works. And that's how Melody and I started. I said, can you give me some words? Like, tell me, tell me about the brain. Tell me how learning works. When she started giving me language, like task initiation, um, like organization and not even organization, like time management. Sure. That's a category. For me, it's time estimation. I'm the person that's like, all right, guys, here's a big project. We can get that done in two months. And my team's like, no, 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 no. This is going to take us six months, <laughs> right? And it's by no fault of my own. Um, but thank goodness I have team members who have much better time estimation skills, much better organization skills, where that is their natural strength. 
and mm -hmm. they get to use that natural strength to strengthen our team and our work. And that's what makes me so excited about this work that Melody and I are doing because we get to bring this to the masses mm -hmm. and this helps everybody, but then especially helps our neurodistinct community in a dignified way mm -hmm. where everybody gets to use this language and personalize it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jack. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mel. Well, I was going to say it's language that people like psychologists and neuropsychs are aware of all the time. And then they hand mm -hmm. someone their report. Here's your, um, you know, ed psych eval. And you're looking at it going processing speed, fluid reasoning, working memory. Uh, I don't know what any of that means. Um, so if the broader community knew what that meant, mm -hmm. then gosh, we could actually use it. Um, so when we think about the skills that are most critical in the workplace for anybody and our community, we want to think about, um, okay, well, this is, this is important actually. Um, a, a st sustained attention or goal-directed persistence. We think of those as executive functioning skills. When we talk about executive functioning skills, we usually think about the obvious things like planning, prioritizing, organization, time management. Um, sometimes we think about metacognition, like thinking about thinking, thinking about how we process. But underneath all of those, because you could call that whole bucket advanced education, uh, advanced executive functioning skills. Underneath the advanced bucket, what you need to have intact to be able to do the prioritizing and the planning are the inside stuff that we don't get to see, like mm -hmm. response inhibition, emotional control, flexibility. Um, yeah, just all those self-regulatory executive functions that don't get talked about as much. So when you see someone that's super disorganized at work, it's not going to do much to help to be like, here, here's a planner. That's for you. Here's some file folders. You can organize yourself now. No, because underneath that is the need for emotional control. If I can't regulate myself, then I'm too stressed out to look at this whole mess and think about how to break it into pieces that are doable. Or when we think about the need for flexibility or, or to be able to shift or transition well, um, you need that underlying getting to the meeting on time. So it's not just like set a buzzer on your watch and get to the meeting on time. No, no, no. <laughs> how does that person transition from place to place or from conversation to conversation or from math to English. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, or from preferred to non-preferred or le le less yes. preferred or how do I cognitively shift? I mean, like, and these are, you know, these are really, it's important to understand those things. And I love that you guys are bringing what we understand, and I think that executive functioning, and I think for the audience, it's it's helpful to think about executive functioning as a suite of skills. Um, and I think, you know, it is beyond goal setting, planning, and execution. Yeah. Because there are neurological processes that underlie those. And I think a lot of research, like I've had, you know, um, numerous like neuropsychs on, on the show to talk about really what executive functioning really is at its core, um, you know, which is conscious, volitional attention on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that sounds really easy, but it's not, right? Mm -hmm. I love that it's being brought into this space because the more that we can understand neurological functioning and that we have words to talk about that. In other words, we have a framework. So oftentimes, we don't know how to speak about ourselves because we never have been asked to think about ourselves in that way. And so mm -hmm. going through the process of this gives you, um, not only does it direct your attention in a, in a way that you might not have done that before, but it also gives you um, the lexicon or the verbiage or the words to express how you think and how you prefer mm -hmm. to think and and how you work comfortably and that when you have to work to the edges or the outside of your comfort levels, that that is a negotiation. 
yeah. not a force. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, play, kind of to playing devil's advocate, because this is another thing that I see is that you know, a lot of uh, businesses don't understand one, for many, there is a requirement for how many disabled individuals should be in your workforce. So mm -hmm. a lot of businesses don't know that, especially if they're receiving federal funding. The mm -hmm. other is that people do not understand under ADA, what are accommodations that should be provided in the workplace. And so a lot of um, I find a lot of my clients don't want to self-disclose because mm -hmm. they are worried about not getting a job, let alone the onboarding or the interview process is heavily weighted against them, right? right. We yeah. talked about that in our last interview, Jess. Mm -hmm. um, but how, like, are you also, Jess, working with companies on, you know, what are accommodations that you must provide and mm -hmm. should provide because this is some this is an area where if advocacy is already poor if i really don't want to be if i really don't want to self disclose mm -hmm. and i'm already worried about losing my job i'm not going to go advocate for accommodations which by the way i need mm -hmm. yeah. because it's equitable not because i'm lazy or unmotivated or don't want to work so how do you navigate that? That's a, I think that's a precarious place, Jess, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you help businesses then understand what kind of accommodations are not only reasonable, but necessary? Yeah, yes. I'm so glad you asked this question. We, um, multiple things that we do, but two to call out. Yeah, two in specific to call out. One we have built an accommodations toolkit and it follows exactly these minds dimensions that melody was just talking about really the core of many are executive function skills um and i it's important to call this toolkit out because um where i think in most companies they rely on oh this is your disability here's some accommodations for you. Not getting into the individualized person, and you both know, of all people, how complex any diagnosis is and how it impacts an individual person. And so what makes me excited about our accommodations toolkit is it's not by diagnosis, it is by your mind's dimensions. So we can go one by one of what is going to be most helpful for you and we break this down as strategies for me, strategies that I can try and implement myself, tools that I can try to use, and strategies for we, those that I might need to ask my manager to help support me in. Mm -hmm. um, this toolkit is designed for two main users. One is the individual, and that's dis whether you disclose your disability or you don't, you can use this toolkit to know what to ask for or how to have a conversation with your manager about what you need to do your best work. Then if you decide that you wanna disclose your disability, you can disclose your disability. That's how you will get the ADA protection to have a fair um, and timely, I'm forgetting the words right now, but that um, interactive process, that's what it is for getting the accommodations that you need. The second audience for this toolkit are our business partners. And when we, any company that hires with us, any company that brings us in for training and consulting, it is now also required that we have a discussion about your accommodations request process. And the way that I talk to the businesses about it, we have this beautiful um, map that I'm really proud of now. And we're calling this the customer journey and accommodations. Just as a business, you are thinking about your customer's experience with your product or your service. You need to think of your employees and potential employees as customers. Mm -hmm. What is their customer experience, right? So this workshop that we will do with them says, here I am as a neurodistinct individual. Here's all the things I might be thinking. Here's all of the messages that are in my mind. And now I'm coming to you, the company's website, internal or external. And where do I go get help? How, where do I find this information? 
And once I send the email, who's going to reach out to me? Are they somebody who is trained and educated in the right accommodations for somebody who is neurodistinct? Most companies, I would say, are most familiar with physical disabilities, providing the right assistive mm -hmm. technology, um, but not as versed in neurodiversity. Some companies are doing amazing in it. Um, but they still really value our toolkit because it's by these cognitive or rather uh, minds dimensions makes it a little simpler. And so the short answer to you, Gwen, is um, if a business works with us, we always have that conversation of what is that experience and journey going to look like? Let's lay it out for you. Not to say, here's all the things you're doing wrong, Let's acknowledge, here's what you've got in place. Here's how we can enhance it. Here's how we can make it better. Um, and what's really special is most of the companies we work with, there's always a personal tie to this work and to our community too. And there's this desire, this growing desire and appreciation for it. Um, mm -hmm. And what gets me excited is when I get to work with parents and companies, siblings, other caretakers, and we're like, look at this. We get to we're doing this work because we want to create a world where our kids are going to be able to step into companies and thrive, be in jobs mm -hmm. and ask for support in whatever way they need to whatever degree they need. If we can just have these conversations in a productive way and to have raised the education and awareness level up, that's going to be such a huge win. Um, and that takes some of, I believe, the stigma out of accommodations and out of mm -hmm. making that, having that disclosure conversation. I've heard horror stories about mm -hmm. our talent yeah. when they even went to HR, when they went to their formal accommodations process and they did not get what mm -hmm. they needed. There was mm -hmm. not understanding on the other end and they just risked everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to shift the burden and we've got to make yeah. businesses aware of of that that risk that they are putting themselves in by not educating themselves, by not thinking thoughtfully about these things. And I tell businesses, the worst thing that can happen to you right now is someone goes on social media and is public about being a neurodistinct colleague. And here was their experience with the company in trying to get an accommodation. Mm -hmm. You don't want to that's yep. let's not make that happen for you. Let's educate your team. Let's give you tools. We are here. We're not here to scare you into it. Like we are here to walk alongside you and what a difference it will make to the community to meet them where they've never been met before in the, in the workplace. Yeah. yeah I love it. I it's, it's great. Go ahead, Mel. Well, just worse. We're, we're uh, I, I just, for the businesses, I just want to say, you know, we have a few that are getting into the game and, um, and we're so proud of them Yeah. and we're so happy that they exist because they're setting, they are the arrow, the tip of the arrow, you know, that is going to bring this change for, you know, for our kids. But the idea is for anybody's kids, for mm -hmm. everybody's kids, um, to get into these positions be, and, and be understood and have uh, their dignity intact. Um, so we're so, so proud of those businesses. And you don't, here's the thing. It's like, you're not by yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to know what you're doing. You, we get to walk beside you and help you think through um, what's available and um, what's possible. You don't have to come into this having any of the answers. You get someone to walk you through the process. It's not on your shoulders. You don't have to be the expert. You can be the business owner. You can be the manager. You don't have to be the expert you get to have help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the big piece here is, is, is changing systems. Um, because the system to this day has been very oppressive. And so this is, this is what we're really trying to, to, to change, right? Which mm -hmm. is through that idea of awareness, you have to have awareness before you have acceptance. You have to accept that those things exist before you have change. It's, mm -hmm. It seems really simple, but it's not easy. Um, and boy, you guys, like work the workplace 
is such, I would say workplace and housing are the two main mm-hmm. areas for the neurodiverse community. Uh, and I'm going to speak for, you know, adults here that really, really impact their well-being. Yeah. And um, we just haven't yeah. even really tipped. We just we just haven't done enough with this. Um, so I thank you guys mm-hmm. for your work here. Um, And that any business who's listening to this and is like, you know what? My DEI initiative is still lacking. I forgot. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize that there's a neurological, these neurological dimensions, this other dimension exists. And actually, it exists more than any other dimension, Mm -hmm. okay, Um, that, you know, reach out to NeuroTalent Works. if your talent and you're like, I don't know how to get a job. I don't even know how to start, but I know I have the potential for that. Reach out to NeuroTalent Works. Like, you know, see if if you can not only participate in their training and their, you know, and their education, but also they're partnered with numerous businesses that might also be a fit for your specific talent profile. Mm-hmm. You know, so Mm -hmm. that's there. Jess, when I spoke to you um, a few years ago about this, for talent, it was free. Yes. Is it still? It is. Oh, my gosh. I just I just want to say, like, (laughs) right, businesses are the ones that are paying for this because they're the ones that have the most to gain financially in in many ways from this. I just want to say, like, The talent, which means that if you're listening to this and you are a neurodivergent or neurodistinct adult who has the potential for competitive employment, you can access this for free. I Mm -hmm. I, like nowhere is that in existence. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is no barrier to this support. Yes. That can potentially be very life changing for somebody. Yeah. So and, yeah. I want to thank you for that. Like just like seriously, you know, and I've I've seen you guys grow and evolve mm. over time and I love where this is going. And I I love I just I love it. I love it. And I love the addition of Melody. <laughs> um if you're interested, I love if you're the in the audience. Of Melody. You love you love the addition <laughs> of Melody, Mel. If you're listening in the audience, you want to find out more about Neurotalent Works, it is neurotalentworks.org. I will yeah. also put that in the description below for all of those, for all of you on YouTube. If you're listening to this, I'll put it in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess and Melody for coming on the show today and just like paving the way, chopping down the bushes. Like <laughs> let's, let's keep doing this. So thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you, Gwen. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Yeah. We're so excited to be talking about this stuff. Love yeah. it. All thank right, you. guys. Thanks, everyone. See you in the next episode.